Welcome. We are here with Deborah Drexler. You visit her solo exhibition of paintings entitled Liquid Sun, presented by the Front Room Gallery. And what we're going to be doing in just a moment is to do a virtual tour of the exhibition. We have Daniel Acock, uh, who is going to be navigating with us through the exhibition. Um, this is just a wonderful opportunity for us to speak with Deborah about her process, her inspiration, and really to see the, the show together. Um, we have a comment from Joe Chalk, just to let everybody know that Hawaii is beautiful today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As every day. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just yeah. for you to, you know, to the audience <laughs> members that are joining us today, uh, Deborah does split her time between New York City and Hawaii. So you're joining us today from New York. Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, welcome. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, if you're ready, we are going to jump into the uh, exhibition. Mm -hmm. So Daniel's just going to get us set up and it will take us to what is basically a digital twin of Deborah's exhibition at the Front Room Gallery. This was, uh, yeah, it's up right now. So here we're looking at Liquid Sun, so a show of uh, paintings by Deborah Drexler. And what I was thinking that is that we could just, yeah, just take a quick glance around uh, as if you were entering the space. And we're gonna take the first piece that we're going to look at is to the left, it's the entitled Violet Eclipse. Okay, so I just wanted to start by um, thanking uh, Kathleen and Daniel for this opportunity and for just the amazing amount of creativity that you've put into uh, adjusting to things during the pandemic. I, I've just been so impressed by how you have um, kept things really interesting for the gallery and kept people in the gallery uh, connected like during I'm a person who's really used to coming back and forth between um, Hawaii and New York frequently and during the pandemic it's the longest period of time in years that I hadn't been to New York and um, Kate and Daniel did these monthly meetings on uh, zoom for all the artists in the gallery and we brainstormed ideas and uh, connect it with what was going on with everybody, you know, during that time. And it just made everything so much more um, connected in such a strong um, community. So I'm really um, grateful to be in this community that comes out of Front Room Gallery. And, um, and I think this is this way that the show is set up is like another aspect of their creativity and ingenuity to um, have a show um, that was envisioned to be safely seen and to go into detail in a, you know, this show was originally hanging in the gallery in, in February and it's being released now um, during a time when it wasn't really safe for people to come into a physical space. So um, there is like a lot of ingenuity that's gone into this. And one of the things this program does is it gets close to the painting. So I'm wondering if we can get really close to this painting um, and look at some of um, some of the dimensionality. So, I mean, this is something that maybe doesn't come through in a photograph, but I think as you come in close, you can get to see a little bit of the layering of paint that happens. And, um, I'm really interested in process and viscosities and, and how to get something that is unexpected to, to happen on a painting surface. And, you know, sometimes I work with acrylic, sometimes I work with oil and um, it's okay archivally to, to layer oil on top of acrylic. And this painting actually 
has both because there are aspects of the surface like this kind of um, uh, pinky red area right, right now that we're on that there are certain things that happened with that surface that could only happen with acrylic in terms of the building up of, of layers. And, but then there's also something else that happens that could only happen with oil on top of it. And in this painting in particular, I play with flatness as well as gestural application and hard edge off of the, the gestural application. And there's some places where the hard edge is acrylic only, and there are some places where it's oil. And there is a different type of um, surface dynamic in a place that is, you know, oil versus acrylic too. So I'm really interested in that, that mystery of the surface that it becomes kind of complex and interesting. And you're not really sure, like that pink actually is oil that hard edge pink shape is an oil shape, but it, it seems like maybe that would be an acrylic shape. So I'm, I'm interested in the mystery. There's a kind of alchemy that happens where you're not exactly sure how, you know, something comes together or is made. Yeah. And there's also a lot of uh, personal kind of chemistry that you're building within the paint usage, right? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. and yeah. and. Sometimes I, I get up to 30 layers of paint. So um, so that idea of, of building on top of the surface until there's a kind of uh, density. I work a lot with transparent uh, pigments and transparent polymers and oil mediums so that, that you have that sense of looking through the layers, you know, all the way to the depth of the surface. I would say the other thing, you know, about that kind of layering is it creates a sense of luminosity. Yeah. So, so the, the layering, it, you know, it's kind of like the glazing techniques when you look at Renaissance paintings and they seem to have a, a sense of glow to them. And that glow is actually through the glazing. It's through that white of the canvas that sits behind all the different layers of oil that you're seeing through. So I'm working with like a similar kind of, of glow and luminosity in the work too, just by doing these transparent layers. And then sometimes though, like, like I go flat and I don't give you access to what's behind there or, or you know, and that intensifies like the sense of tension or mystery in the painting as well. And you had spoken just briefly about the idea of like the gestural brush strokes. I mean, these are kind of <laughs> very uh, physical uh, in your, you know, body, uh, you know, interaction with applying the paint because you're using them sometimes you're painting on the floor, you know, with the, the long brush strokes, but also pouring paint and then moving them to the wall and back down. Yeah. Right? And that's the, Yes, and that's a five foot by seven foot paint painting. Yeah, so these there are is very a kind large, of large, right? <laughs> I know there yeah. is a kind of a. I think I I in the statement when we were working on our the statement for this show, I described to it as a a muscular femininity because uh -huh. I'm also working with these feminist you know reference colors of the pinks and the lilacs, but but there is a kind of you know muscularity and physicality. Um, about the paintings themselves and and really this these paintings will go through you know all these different versions where they're up and down and up and down because I, I work with uh, pooling of paint and different viscosities and and then that liquidity you know would move if I if I put it up so I have to like put things down sometimes to dry or work down on the floor but then I have to put it up to see it and then you know some of the the flatter, the more precise marks or the impasto marks than I work up. So, so it's constantly this kind of um, physical, physical dance with the paint. Um, I actually do a lot of exercise so I can deal with my own paintings. I, I, <laughs> I ran across the Williamsburg Bridge this morning. So, you know, so right. it's like, Right. So it's like a, it, it's another kind of physical challenge or the way to, to take on the paintings. 
Yeah. Well, let's move on to the next piece okay. in the show. Okay. Uh, and I just love this um, composition. This one's called Sapphire Bridge, which is a great title um, for this piece. This one is 48 by 72. Uh, also quite large, not, not as large as the other one, but definitely has like a real presence to it. Uh, a lot of yours, you know, they do have um, a body relationship to them physically as far as the scale. Of yeah, them. and I, I'd say this scale is very human size. The five by seven is a, a little bigger than human, but this one is a human size painting. And I mean, in this one, I can talk a little bit about length of time of process too, because um, even though the paintings appear very quick, you know, I'll work on them for months at a time. And this one actually I worked on for two years. Wow. So yeah. 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 So it was it was done over a two year time period, split by um because um normally I'm only uh in New York for the summer. So it was split by a term at UH and then I came back again and um and work back into it and I will keep I will keep working on a painting until there is until two things I want to see something in the painting that I haven't seen before like something that that is original and something um, that is like a little bit undecipherable in the painting but then the other thing is like I will keep working on something until there's nothing about the painting that bothers me so I'm very much of a process oriented artist in that I um, put down something and then I respond to what it is that I'm working on. Would, yeah, would you say that you kind of work intuitively uh, one? I do. On? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely work intuitively. And, um, it, you know, I'd say my roots are, are as this kind of abstract um painter who worked intuitively my early work in college was like that and then i went through a time period where um i did a lot of narrative work and um at some point i returned to what i started to do but I, with a different perspective so i had been doing a lot of feminist narrative work for probably 20 years and then when I came back to um, to abstract painting, you know, which in 1950s, 60s was very male dominated art form, you know, I I started to look at it and said, well, what can be what can be different about this in the 21st century? And what can I bring to this, you know, as a woman, as a feminist that that is speaking to today? and is speaking to um, embodying the painting today as, as a female artist. So, so I would say that, that these are some of the, the ways that it's evolved. So this kind of uh, journey I went through with, with, um, with narrative art kind of brought me back again to my roots as an abstract painter. And I've always seen an abstraction, this idea, um, um, I'm getting a message from um, Heather. Am I having some audio issue? We hear you fine. Yeah, we hear you fine. Can everybody do a thumbs up if they hear Deborah okay? I didn't see the whole message, but let me just go into chat and see. And while you're oh. looking at that and see. Oh, okay, okay. It's not about sound, it's about an idea. And I'll look at that later. <laughs> okay. Okay. So Heather wrote. But maybe. But maybe. Um, sorry. Yeah, this is a comment maybe, from Deborah for Deborah from Heather that uh, she doesn't know if you know Audrey Lord's essay, "The Uses of the Erotic." The erotic is power. These really connect with your ideas, uh, where she re rejects the erotic as imposed sexuality and sees it as a female creative force. Hmm. I so mean, it's not I, about the audio. <laughs> okay, good. I, I, I was reading erotic as audio. So, okay, okay. I just thought flash really fast. But um, um, 
yeah, I have heard of that essay and I never connected it to my, my work before now. So I will reread it again and, and think about it in that context. And um, Heather actually is an art historian who wrote about my narrative work. So I did a, a project called um, Gauguin Zombie, um, which was shown, um, it was my actually my first solo show in New York at White Box, had an annex in 2005, but it was also shown at Honolulu Museum and at Maui Arts and Cultural Center. And it was um, very complex fictional exhibit about Gauguin coming back to life in the, in the um, 21st century as a zombie. And it, it, it had writing and thatched huts and kind of the short version is um, post-colonial theory meets Night of the Living Dead. There was also a strong kind of f feminist um, plot line running through it. So um, I know Heather originally from, she um, wrote about, um, wrote about Gauguin Zombie in a chapter of a book that she was working on about Gauguin. So, um, so I think that's an interesting insight to bring into the work and I'll definitely um, look into that a little bit more. Excellent. Yeah, well, thank you, Heather. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll take questions too, if anybody, and, and Kate has to read them because I'm looking, because I'm in my studio, I'm looking on my phone. I don't have internet in the studio. So, um, but if people want to ask questions as we're going, um, please just, you know, type questions and Kate will read them to me too. Exactly. Yeah, that's a nice way to do it because we realized uh, with these, if everybody's audio is open, it's very difficult to hear uh, the speakers. So this is just a nice way for people to be able to communicate through the chat box. Um, yeah. So this is kind of standing back at the gallery. We're now looking at a larger vertical piece. And this one is titled Urban Swing. Um, and there is something that I did think that would be nice for you to discuss with everybody, which is um, your selection of color palette. Um, and we had had sure. a discussion too about the idea of artificial colors versus more natural colors. I know that um, there is an idea, you know, within the feminist idea that the color palette itself is very indicative of uh, femininity, but these large scale gestural abstract uh, pieces relate back to like the male uh, component of it, but the color is really uh, something uh, that you've uniquely developed here. So maybe you could speak to people about that. Um, sure, sure. And and Olga just asked about the the I think the smaller piece. You mean the four by six foot? The title yeah, of that one is got... Sapphire Bridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so just just um, just like. The work is layered. I'd say all of my, the content is very layered too. Cause it's not just, it's not just one thing but there are, there are many things that lead into the color. So, um, so first of all, there is a definite um, choice in the pinks um, to kind of play against the, the macho, um, archetype of the abstract expressionist, you know, and I, I did a show called Pink, a two person show a few years ago, where it's really focused in, on that idea of pink. So, so there is this choice with pink um, having to do with um, feminism and that representation of the, the female, but kind of empowered female when you see these uh, pastel brush strokes, but they're done with this kind of um uh powerful um um powerful momentum right so that's like that's like um one layer and that that comes out of my my earlier explorations of feminist art and 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 seeing myself within the that history of abstract expressionism, but again, taking it to who, what is it in the 21st century that can be done differently. 
I think there is another thing too of, of um, Hawaii itself, like the color seems synthetic, but actually um, we have colors like this all around us in Hawaii. Like it, it the color is, is more visually intense in Hawaii. It's almost unbelievable, you know, yeah. coming yeah. from a skyline in New York where mm -hmm. you don't see this intensity of color. It seems, yeah. you know, really it, fantastical. Yeah, and I mean, it's real. It's like we see color like this in, in Hawaii for, and um, we got a couple of people who like uh, Olga, who has lived in Hawaii, Jody's in Hawaii, who, who know like this is color that you see. And then um, the third layer of it is there, there is like also a spiritual aspect of my work that I see these as this, I, I'm a daily meditator. I have this, this feeling of joy and lifting up and, and light and movement when I meditate, but also when I meditate, I've had the experience of, um, of seeing color, but the color is actually more vivid than any color that I see, even in Hawaii, when I open my eyes. So, so there's this other aspect of, of this kind of bright, joyful color that I see when I meditate, like also trying to get at, at what can I do to get that intensity of color and the intensity comes really pretty much through the layering process you know through through the layering and through interactions and then i guess a fourth aspect of this is you know i i'm an you know there's a lot of talk about zombie formalism i don't think i'm a zombie formalist but i think i i have a kind of ingrained formalism too with how i look at color interactions and how things work and i mean that just comes out of i you know i've been an art professor for over 30 years and and you know i'm constantly thinking about or talking about like interactions of color and, and composition so there is a kind of um formalist aspect too and that formalism and those ideas of formalism also, you know, go back to earlier abstraction and the history of abstraction. Yeah, but it's in your subconscious. Right? It's in my subconscious because I'm I'm just living it all the time. So yeah, I just, you know, it's like it's like breathing to me at this point because I'm either looking at my paintings or someone else's paintings almost all the time. So yeah, well, Karen Unger <laughs> so, has a comment. You know, just talking uh -huh. about. You know, before you were speaking a little bit about water, you know, coming from Hawaii mm -hmm. and the, that kind of palette mm -hmm. and the light there, that mm -hmm. she feels like a lot of these paintings have a very underwatery feel, like pigment mm -hmm. swirling in water. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that might have to do with your process because you do float, you know, different colors into liquid, you know, while they're still yeah. fluid. Yeah, yeah, my process, and, and the name of the show is Liquid Sun. Um, yeah, I can see a relationship to Kim Kieber's photos. I love his photos a lot, actually. Um, yeah, if people yeah. are unfamiliar with Kim Kieber, he actually is dropping pigment into uh, body liquid bodies of uh, terrariums of water and then photographing them. And there has mm -hmm. this like cloud kind of form of them mm -hmm. that are, you know, in a way that is very fantastical. Mm -hmm. Can we zoom in tighter on this piece and look at some of the detail of it, maybe? um because like if it, it's this piece has a lot of texture to it like even if you look over to the in that blue shape like it, the whole shape looks flat but then there's an impasto blue kind of under it under it yeah to there and then you know there's again the play of the matte the blue is very matte but the orange is really glossy uh -huh. And then this one, it's, it's really a little more minimal than some of the others, but I liked the, I liked the negative space that I was getting with it and the openness of it. Maybe if you keep moving. So that you can see some of the layering there. 
it's interesting to me that that this one in particular, you can really see the the neutral uh, color in there. Yeah, that kind of a beige mm -hmm. and the brown. You know, uh -huh. to me that those are very like earth based colors, where a lot of the other ones are relating to me more to atmospheric, you know, uh, air, water, um, just the color itself. And you're doing these very intentional forms in this that have a feeling almost like a cutout. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and then the flat paint, you know, was just painted many layers to get it that flat too. Yeah. And then, com you know, compared on the, you know, with the impasto that you you've kind of done like mm -hmm. almost a dry brush over top to raise the, mm -hmm. the levels of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you well, actually the actually the the really thick impasto on that big um, periwinkle shape mm -hmm. is underneath the periwinkle shape, so it's, oh, so it's, it's over embedded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's underneath it, and you can see a little bit of the pink like that's underneath comes through where it breaks open. Mm-hmm. And in that orange, but, there's almost like this like amber quality at the top where it's super mm -hmm. uh, translucent. Uh-huh. Oh yeah, through there. And I like there sometimes to be a bit of a mystery that you don't know what's sitting on top of what. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maybe we should swing around the corner. Peggy um, just asked a question. I oh, I yeah, that. I see that. How do you decide a particular pore's shape? How are you thinking about specific things? Uh, or are you thinking about specific things or is it more a response to the process? It's, uh, it's, it's more a response both to the process and to, to what's there. So I'll manipulate the pour on the surface and, um, you know, in relationship to the other things that I'm seeing. And sometimes I'll do multiple pours, sometimes of the same color. Sometimes if you zoom into the bottom left corner, of this one, you can see that, um, like there's many pores there, but, and then that's what makes it like more mysterious. It's not just one, but I kept pouring on top of other pores until I got like a shape that I wanted. And again, it to look less, less predictable as a pour. And then you're manipulating the paint. The and pour. then I manipulate the pour in the pour sometimes. Sometimes I pre-mix it and some, like if you go back around the corner to the last one we were looking at to the top of it, um if we go back um up and to the Olga top of the comments uh Olga Cordero Brana uh says uh, floating in the blue Pacific Ocean or flying through the blue skies it's yeah it's hard to tell apart yeah so it does seem like it's it could be the ocean or it could be the sky and that's interesting too I mean even with abstract work there is always this implied idea of perspective you know sure. whether you're from mm -hmm. above or you're looking out um mm -hmm. you know and that's it that's something interesting that you've um really distorted in these is that you uh given this idea for the viewer you know almost of a disorienting feel where you're you are kind of feeling this like idea of like floating yeah the very top of this one those oranges and yellows at the very top. Yeah, some are poured and some are painted. And some are transparent pours and some are painted or some are opaque pours. So I was really playing with like the difference between, you know, you can't really tell what's poured and what's painted because they all inter interlock with each other. Yeah, let's uh, let's go back to Baroque Bloom. Okay, that was a great okay. question by Peggy Cyphers. You know, it was know. great. Thanks. That's a painter asking another painter a question. <laughs> yeah, but she's really <laughs> about your process, so that's helpful. You know. Yeah. 
Peggy and I have like done a lot of projects together. Yeah, um, she's an excellent painter as well. Yes, she is. So in this one you have, we spoke a little bit about the lower left four, but then there's also this really gorgeous four on the upper left hand corner. I mean, oh yeah. That. I love that. I mean, this has so much buildup of the, um, the material in the center, but then there's this like really nice pooling that happens there in that in section. Yeah, and that has a really sharp, you know, contrast and, and, complementary contrast with this kind of blue green against that rich red but it's like very um clean and flat next to the red yeah yeah i just love like this really uh intense density the impasto in the center of the painting baroque plume yeah, Daniel wants you to talk about the plume. <laughs> well, it just it just looked like a plume to me, and then it also looked a little baroque. So it seemed like that was that was what its name was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there is a baroque quality sometimes to how I bend space because I like this kind of. Um, warping and distortion of space and push pull that becomes a kind of baroque thing yeah well let's continue now to mm -hmm. cool glide right yeah This one, I really feel a lot of people have said that said to me that it has this like a uh, candy feel like a uh, hard candy surface. Yeah, especially that orange area. Yeah. yeah, I love the overlapping shapes in this one. And it, even in the center where they kind of like almost kiss, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are the blue and the yellow. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And this one again is more minimal. So it's like each painting kind of tells me where it wants to go, you know, and, and I stop at the right place. So this one, this one, you know, has less in terms of like gestural marks or painterliness, but it kind of needed the openness to allow that candy part to shine in the simplicity of it. Yeah. But you're also still dealing with the manipulation of the opacities with them, the transparencies. Some of yes, them exactly. actually achieved, you know, through true transparency, but some of them, is that not um, a painted color for the overlap? It is. Yeah, sometimes it's both. It's both. Yeah. And again, that's like that bit of like leaving you a little unsure about how it was made. Yeah. That's always the interesting thing with the visual transparencies in painting. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have the mm -hmm. idea of the viewer that it's achieved through just a very simple overlapping process, but it's never that quite that simple. Um, yeah, it's have yeah. that clarity of color for it. Mm -hmm. it's great the option, mm -hmm. but it really uh, would be, you know, the imaginary idea of, of these shapes overlapping. And then you've created some interesting volume in there. A lot of this that had, does have the flat forms and then there's the, 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 the brush strokes to build the volume. In there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So if we continue through the exhibition, we're gonna move now to the right wall. And yeah. So this one is called Orange Meander. Uh, and in the documentation of this, you can really see that the upper right hand surface has quite a nice glossy sheen to it that's countered with the very flat matte uh, blues mm -hmm. uh, and the mid and uh, lower portion of the, this uh, vertical composition. Mm -hmm. This one is 84 by 60, so a very large scale. Another big one, yes. <laughs> And yeah. this is another one that has both oil and acrylic. You can see some of that 
impasto, that pink impasto is an, is an oil impasto. And the green you, impasto actually is What acrylic. medium are you adding to the oil to, to get that uh, thickness? Um, gal Kid, like the Gal Kid gel. Uh-huh, so it's like a gel medium that builds up the mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a I lot of times, a lot of, yeah, a lot of times I'll build texture with acrylic first, but then there's sometimes where I've already switched to oil and I feel like it needs um, more impasto. And then I have to do the impasto with, with oil in those places to make that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a, you know, compared to the piece that we just looked at, uh, has a lot more activity uh to it joanne has a question for you do you ever do any sanding to take away texture not necessarily because i work on i work on canvas so the sanding might be a little too rough because the paint really is on there i tend to be more of a builder sometimes i do scraping though um when the paint's wet yeah, but you're really mostly focusing on an additive process, right? Rather than yeah, it, I'm more additive than subtractive. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's how you can control is by the overlayering and uh, removal mm -hmm. through addition of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like those really nice washes of green over the blue. And the orange meander is that form that meanders diagonally down. Yeah. There's almost like a slight blue bullseye effect in the upper right hand. One. Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, great. So should we continue now? Sure. This is the... Uh, Joanne oh. has a comment. Yeah, she's that saying in. that uh, the orange meander has a bit of the Masika quality to oh. it. <laughs> and for you uh, <laughs> that are visiting, you know, viewing today, Mark Masika is another painter that we work with at the uh, front room uh, gallery who does uh, more along the lines of linear abstraction. Uh, so we can see that with the orange meander, that meandering line <laughs> through. And Peggy Cyphers has a comment, impressive work, joyful, jo joyful yet complex. Oh, thank you. So now we've come to the title piece of the exhibition, which is Liquid Sun. Um, and I do feel like each piece really is dealing with its own color palette. There's, a, you know, there's definitely colors that are um, utilized throughout the exhibition. Number one, really being that those pinks in it. Um, but with the orange meander, obviously the orange became a, a, a uh, yes. <laughs> there's no orange in this one. Yeah. <laughs> but this does have that nice, like, kind of a golden uh, yellow in it. Mm -hmm. It's working so nicely mm -hmm. with the violets and the pinks in it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I guess that's it too. Like I, I like to try different things with colors and sometimes I like to put colors together that don't seem like they should work and make them work. So, you know, I like the challenge of like figuring out something that you wouldn't expect together. And then, you know, how do you, how do you bring that together? Like, you know, that, ochre um with the violet necessarily wouldn't you wouldn't see those two together necessarily but then they're balanced out by that bit of turquoise um to the side 
Yeah. And this one you have left some indicators of a various orientation while you were creating the composition. Mm -hmm. um, what you can see like kind of the, the pools of the paint, you know, in the bottom left uh, kind of the drips, but they're going horizontally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you could zoom in on that lower right. I mean, I'm sorry, lower left. Yeah, I kind of liked what happened with those drips that they made a line. I tend not to leave a lot of drips. It yeah, becomes like you, you've really made them very intentional with the yeah, you know, yeah, the, yeah, mm -hmm. that golden around mm -hmm. to articulate them even more. Yeah, I actually painted around them rather than covering them. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting in these that there's always so much more to see within the, the reaction of the surface, the texture, the color mm -hmm. um, throughout, you know, and the, really depending on the time of day, you know, that they do have a very responsive quality to natural light too. Yeah, I tend to paint in daylight rather than at night because I, I you know, want to see that kind of brightness of the sun on them and what that can do. Yeah. I'm happy because I have a studio with like really big windows right now. So. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah, it's nice to see your pieces behind you just to give them yeah. a fail. Yeah, yeah, so. definitely. So maybe we just do one more quick walk through the show. And if anybody has any final questions for Deborah, um, we can uh, have her answer those right now. So if you yeah. have any questions, just type those into the chat box. Yeah, we're just kind of going through again the pieces. You know, it was interesting uh, in installing this exhibition, uh, just like how the pieces themselves communicated with each other, you know, because you do have these really uh, active, bold, you know, brush strokes here in this corner and like the communication between these two, I just love, you know, the Sapphire Bridge. Mm -hmm. and the, yeah, those really look like they, they belong together actually. Yeah, yeah. Mark has something, I just um, see, because yeah. I'm on my phone, I just see parts of the messages. Uh -huh. Yeah, so Mark Masiga says it's a, bright show at a time we really need one. It uh, looks good. Thanks, Deborah. Oh, thank you. Anyone have any other questions about them? I'm playing my right, teacher so that mode means here. That we did our job, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah. I like it when everybody feels very fulfilled. <laughs> uh, Heather does have a question. Okay. <laughs> uh, Heather Waldrup, uh, she said, Deborah, I'd love to know more about the pieces you chose not to include in the show. And just really, she's uh, thinking about your selection process. Well, um, actually that part of it is a collaboration because uh, it was done with, um, with Kate and Daniel. So I did, I didn't, uh, solely pick which pieces, but um, we did a lot of um, Zoom talk and um, and 
looked at things together and thought about which pieces would go together. And I think one thing that was bold um, that Kate and Daniel wanted to do, because I have a lot of medium sized pieces and they were like, let's show all big work. So, yeah. so that was like really fun to, to focus on like some of the largest pieces that I've been working on lately. So, so it really was a, a collaboration with the gallery and, and like part of like, you know, what's their vision for the show along with, um, with mine. So I think it was different than, I have a show up right now at Maui Arts and Cultural Center. And with that show, um, it was more of a thing where I actually made the work for the show. So everything that I made, I knew was gonna be going together in the show. But with this show, um, we just went through my, my body of work that I've been doing over the past couple of years and picked pieces that, that had a conversation with each other. Yeah, for us, it was really important that they did have this kind of conversation, you know, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. that they were all, they were all kind of doing similar, but different things. Um, Andrea Morgenstern does have a question. Um, mm -hmm. She asks, in some paintings, I see jellyfish and other sea creatures. Is that intentional? No, no, to me, it's about shape and form. That's just a bit more abstract. But I mean, that is kind of a thing that people do with abstract paintings. People tend to, especially if they're biomorphic, to read, you know, human figures, clouds, biomorphic forms. And, and definitely we have like a, a response to nature. So, you know, I would say there's, a, there's an influence of nature in the work, especially coming from Hawaii, but then it's a much more abstract kind of influence. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if we have any more questions, now would be the time uh, to take the opportunity to ask Deborah about that. Otherwise, um, we are going to wrap this up and thank everybody for coming. It was really a pleasure, Deborah, to speak with you today. The, Front Room Gallery is just so honored to have this exhibition. Olga writes, thanks Deborah and Kathleen for organizing this beautiful works. And it really was our pleasure. I mean, I love doing these virtual tours because it does give a kind of a global audience an opportunity mm -hmm. to take a look at the work with us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, thank you. And it's been such a pleasure to put it together and to work with you. And, and yeah, it's, it's always a joy. Fun. So. It yeah. was really fun. They moved my paintings. Um, actually, it was the week I was working on a documentary for the Maui show. They set up my paintings in a blizzard, right? In February, wasn't it something like a blizzard? Yes. <laughs> and I considered coming to New York, but there were quarantines like both in New York and Hawaii. It would have been impossible to come for like a week to help install. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, so thank really you for- this whole season really developed out of, you know, a desire to move forward with the gallery and exhibition, mm -hmm. keep on showcasing work, even during COVID. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. we were super thrilled to have this show up and now to be able to present it to the audience here, uh, global audience, really. Uh, yeah, Heather, yeah, it's great. Yeah, Heather writes, thanks, mm -hmm. Deborah and Kathleen. It was so wonderful to hear Deborah talk in great depth about her work, exclamation point. <laughs> uh, that it's Thank you. amazing that this show <laughs> happened given the insanity of last year yeah and I think we can all yes. <laughs> definitely agree with that <laughs> yes well thank you everyone uh it was really a pleasure to have you uh here today at the front room gallery's virtual tour of Deborah Drexler's solo exhibition Liquid Sun <laughs> Whilst we're seeing writes very intriguing work. Thanks. Uh, thanks. And thank you, Deborah. This was really Thank impressive. you. This was great. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. And thanks for all the great questions and for everybody who attended. And um, yeah, it was great to see so many people. Thank, thank you all and um, appreciate it so much. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, wonderful. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, it really was okay. a pleasure. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.